is extremely uh, blessing and God uh, bless you and protect you from any evil and any harm so you can continue this uh, journey of serving uh, people in need for a long, long time. So but I don't want to take too much of your time. I know that you have a lot to, to share and we are here and many people online to uh, listen to you and learn from your, your experiences, your ideas, your suggestion and your information. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Imam Ilahi, for that warm welcome. Um, I'd, I'd also like to thank Jennifer and everyone at the Islamic House of Wisdom for hosting us tonight. Um, we're delighted to partner with you and with this important community institution. So good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Christine Ajrouche, and on behalf of my colleagues in McFad, which stands for the Michigan Center for Contextual Factors in Alzheimer's Disease, I welcome you all to this evening's community coffee time online. I want to first uh, introduce my co-moderators for today's event, Dr. Wasim Taraf. Uh, I don't know, Wasim, if you're there, maybe you can give a little wave. Um, Noor Fakuri, Noor, if you're there, you can give a little wave, and Donna Jawad. This evening, um, we are pleased to present a discussion on how to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Following a short presentation, we have two guests joining, uh, joining us, Dr. Navid Saraji, who is a neurologist from the University of Michigan, and Melanie Baird, Vice President of Programs at the Alzheimer's Association Greater Michigan Chapter. Melanie is also an esteemed member of McFad's Community Advisory Board. Both will offer a two to three minute commentary reflecting on their expertise to provide insights and resources available for individuals and families living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Then we will invite all of you to join the discussion by asking questions and sharing your own observations. Um, but first, I'm gonna start with a brief introduction of who we are and what we hope to do. McFad is a relatively new center formed three years ago through funding by the National Institute on Aging. It's housed, at the University of Michigan, and we partner with uh, Michigan State University, Wayne State University, and Eastern Michigan University. With this partnership, we benefit from excellent existing programs at these universities that work to understand and effectively treat health problems. As you may have guessed, at our center, we focus on the growing and concerning issue of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, uh, which we refer to as ADRD. We want to do our best to share what's known about ADRD, and that's why McFad is committed to organizing and sponsoring community events every month or so for five years. We thank you all and like to commend you for taking time out this evening to be here, for wanting to learn more and raise awareness about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. As you listen to our discussion this evening, say hello in the comment section of Facebook and feel free to write questions. We hope that this Facebook live streaming will be interactive. So please don't be shy. Our goal is to have you join our discussion as we work to provide the information you need. In addition to bringing the latest information on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, we are very committed to advancing research on Arab American communities. Research is so important because it provides the information that we need to not only find a cure for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, but also to help families living with ADRD to have the best quality of life possible. Right now, there's very little research that focuses on Arab Americans. That's why we invite you, community members of all ages, to be part of our research pool. You're all invited to, and we certainly hope you will, complete a short survey so that you can become part of our pool of potential research participants. While this doesn't guarantee that you'll be offered a chance to participate, 
participate in research, it does tell us that you're interested and willing to consider it. If you're invited to participate in a research project in the future, the project would be explained to you at that time and you'll be given the opportunity to ask questions about it. And then you can decide if you want to participate in that particular project. If you've been to our events before and already filled out the short survey, no need to do it again. We will paste the link to the survey in the comment box um, on, the, um, on the Facebook page. Feel free to click on it so that you will have it available to complete at the end of our time together this evening. All of the activities we do at McFad are meant to enable the center to address unique and specific issues that the Arab American community faces. We would like to learn more about and also to work closely with all of you to help families in our community who are living with Alzheimer's disease. Today's community coffee time will also have a raffle to win one of two $50 gift cards to Target. The first opportunity to win the $50 Target gift card will be from completing the short survey that invites you to be part of our research pool. Completing this short survey will enter you into the raffle. The second opportunity to win a $50 Target gift card is after you provide feedback about today's event. It will only take two minutes of your time and is a way for you to tell us what you would like to hear about in the future. Completing this survey enters you into our raffle a second time. So completing both surveys gives you two chances to win a $50 gift card to Target. Uh, what I'd like to do now is turn the screen over to Dr. Taraf, who will say a few words in Arabic. Thank you, Christine. مساء الخير اولا خليني اوجه الشكر للامام الهي والسيده جينيفر الهي جميع الاشخاص ببيت الحكم الاسلامي على استضافتهم لنا الليله بيسعدنا انه نتشارك بمهمتنا مع هالمؤسسه المجتمعيه المهمه اسمي الدكتور وسيم طراف وبالنيابه عن زملائي بمركز مكفاد اللي هو مركز ميشيغان للعوامل السيائيه بمرض الالزهايمر بدي رحب فيكم جميعا بندوتنا الليله اللي بنظمها المركز عبر الانترنت اولا بدي اقدم لكم المشرفين المشاركين بحدث اليوم دكتوره كريستين عجروش السيده نور نور فخوري والسيده دونا جواد هالمساء بيسعدنا تقديم مناقشه حول كيفيه تقليل مخاطر الاصابه بمرض الالزهايمر بعد عرض قصير حينضم لنا ضيفين الدكتور نفيد سراجي وهو طبيب اعصاب مختص من جامعه ميشيغان وميلاني بيرد نيبه رئيس برامج بالالزهايمر اسوسيشن بولايه ميشيغان ميلاني هي كمان عضو بالمجلس الاستشاري المجتمعي التابع لمركز مكفاد كل منهم حيقدم تعليق قصير دقيقتين لثلاث دقائق بيعكس خبرتهم وبيلخص رؤيتهم حول الموارد المتاحة للأفراد والعائلات اللي بيعيشوا مع مرض الألزايمر ندعيكم جميعا للانضمام للمناقشة عن طريق طرح أسئلة ومشاركتكم بملاحظاتكم من خلال الفيسبوك خليني اوصف لكم بايجاز مركز دراسه الاعراض والامراض الاجتماعيه اللي هو مكفاد. المركز تشكل حديثا بتمويل من المعهد الوطني لدراسه الشيخوخه، المكان الاساسي هو بجامعه ميشيغان بان اربر ولكن بيتضمن مشاركه من جامعه ميشيغان ستيت، وين ستيت، وايسترن ميشيغان. مهمه رؤيه المركز بتتضمن الاستفاده من طاقات الابحاث والبرامج الممتازه بهالجامعات لحتى نتمكن من دراسه وفهم المشاكل الصحيه اللي بتسبق وبتتزامن مع مرض الالزهايمر والامراض المتصله فيه. احدى المهمات الاساسيه للمركز هي انه نحاول قدر المستطاع انه نشارك المعلومات اللي بينتجها المركز على صعيد الدوله معكم ومع فعال انه نعمل فعاليات ومنتديات لحتى ننشر ونعلم حول المسائل المتعلقه بالصحه الاجتماعيه خلال الخمس سنوات القادمه. ركيزه ثانيه واساسيه للمركز هي التزامنا بتطوير الابحاث المتعلقه بامراض الالزهايمر خاصه بالجاليه العربيه. حاليا في عدد نادر من الابحاث اللي بتركز على جاليتنا لهالسبب نحن اليوم بندعيكم جميعا كاعضاء بهالجاليه من جميع الاعمار لحتى تكونوا جزء وتشاركونا تشاركوا معنا بالابحاث والدراسات اللي نتامل انه نطورها. املنا انه تساعدونا بانجاح المهمه بقدر المستطاع. املنا كمان انه من خلال النشاط اللي عم نعمله اليوم ونشاطاتنا المستقبليه انه نمكن المركز من دراسه ومعالجه القضايا الفريده والمحدده اللي بتواجه المجتمع العربي الامريكي. 
اثناء مشاهده النقاش اليوم والاستماع للمعلقين من فضلكم قولوا مرحبا باسم التعليقات بالفيسبوك وما تتردد بكتابه اسئله نتامل انه يكون هالمنتدى عبر الانترنت تفاعلي لذلك من فضلكم ما تخجلوا هدفنا هو ان نكون قادرين على توفير المعلومات اللي بتحتاجوها حنوضع رابط الاستطلاع بمربع التعليقات على الفيسبوك ما تترددوا بكبسوا حتى يكون لكم متاح الفرصه لحتى تكملوا هالاستطلاعات معنا اليوم خلال وجودكم معنا كمان حيكون فرصتين لربح بطاقتين كل وحده بقيمه 50 دولار الفرصه الاولى للفوز هي باكمال الاستطلاع الرأي القصير اللي حتكون اللي بدعيك لحتى تكون جزء من مجموعه الابحاث اللي عندنا اكمال هالاستبيان القصير حيدخلك بالسحب الفرصه الثانيه اللي حتى تفوزوا هي بعد اكمال استطلاع رأي حول حدث اليوم حيستغرق الامر حوالي دقيقتين بس من وقتكم وهي طريقه بتتيح لكم تخبرونا عن المواضيع اللي بهمكم تسمعوها بالمستقبل. طبعا فيكم تفوزوا باي واحد من هالبطاقتين او هالبطاقتين سوا. شكرا. كريستين؟ اوكي. سو Uh, this evening's uh, program is uh, going to address the topic of how to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's uh, is a growing and concerning disease for all of us. It's estimated that there will be a 60% increase in the proportion of the population that has Alzheimer's disease by 2030. That's just 10 years from now. Over uh, a 14 year period bet between the year 2000 and 2014, the causes of death due to cancer, heart disease and stroke have decreased. On the other hand, the causes of death due to Alzheimer's disease has increased over the same 14 year period by 89%. There are many, um, Sorry. Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia. Just like there are many types of uh, cancers, for example, there are also many types of dementia, about 70 types in total. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. Approximately 60 to 70% of dementia cases are Alzheimer's disease. If you suspect a family member may have dementia, it's best to go to a doctor. A doctor can help you get a specific diagnosis and that is so important because each type of dementia has different causes. So knowing which type of dementia a person has will help you understand what's happening now and help you plan for the future. Now it's, it's important to note that the average age at onset of dementia is 80 years old. As we grow older, we often find that we forget things more easily. And given that Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is more common because people are living longer, we may ask, are we getting dementia? So I wanna take just a few minutes to distinguish between what are normal age-related changes and what might be symptoms of dementia. Normal age-related age-related changes include maybe forgetting someone's name that you've just met and then remembering it later. Or maybe you, need, you find that you need to take a minute to think of the word that you're looking for. Or you find that now you have to write down appointments uh, in order for you to help, in order to help you remember them. Those are normal um, things that happen as we get older. Symptoms of dementia, on the other hand, are a bit different. Um, whereas we may forget as a normal part of aging someone's name that we've just met, if we're unable to remember someone that we've known for a long time, then we might start to get concerned. Or maybe we get lost going to places that we often go to, like going to work or going to the grocery store, or maybe even finding our way back home. Um, then that's a cause for concern. Um, if we're unable to think of the word for a very common object like a chair or a coffee pot, then that's also cause for concern. It's important to remember that the symptoms of dementia are progressive. In other words, they tend to get worse over time. 
The main symptoms of different types of dementia, however, include memory loss, language problems, changes in judgment and reasoning. Now, although the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is increasing, what we're finding through research is that one third of all dementia cases are preventable. That's very exciting news because what it tells us is that we can do things to reduce our risk. So what I'd like to do today is touch on a few of those. Um, the first one is eating healthy. Um, eating healthy means that we're going to have a high intake of plant foods, so vegetables and legumes. And these kinds of foods are very common in um, uh, people who come from the, uh, the part of the world near the Mediterranean. So a lot of individuals from Arabic speaking countries already have as a common or base it, base to their diet, the kinds of foods that are most recommended by professionals. So high intake of plant foods, moderate consumptions of dairy products, uh, fish and poultry. Olive oil is very good for us. And olive oil, as you all know, is a very common staple in the Mediterranean diet. Low intake of red meat and very low intake of processed foods. But it is nice to know that the, the diet that those of us who uh, are, those of us who come from Arab backgrounds, um, our basic diet is one that's considered very healthy and is oftentimes recommended by healthcare professionals. Um, something else that we can do is um, engage socially. Don't isolate yourself. Visit with friends and extended family. Get involved in your community. Now, I'm going to note that with the pandemic, it's a little bit more challenging, but we can shift the ways that we connect with people uh, by using video technology and connecting with others through phones uh, by using our, uh, if you have a FaceTime uh, app or if you have Skype or if you have Zoom, um, just staying connected is extremely important. Research is increasingly showing that those who are socially engaged uh, do much better uh, when it comes to uh, staving off the risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, another important way that we can reduce our risk is by staying active. Exercise is so important. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to take a membership out at a gym in order to be active. You just need to move, take a walk around the block. Uh, that's, that's allowing you to be active and um, protect yourself from sedentary behaviors that increase our risks of um, of becoming ill and, and potentially having Alzheimer's disease. So staying active is very important. Um, there's also increasing evidence that education can reduce our risk. And it's an extremely powerful um, resource. This picture comes from a research study that aimed to examine links between detecting Alzheimer's disease in the brain and observing the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in real time, such as memory loss or confusion. The images in this picture represents a scan of three brains. The top picture is of a brain of someone who has at least some college education. The middle brain is of someone with a high school diploma. And the brain presented at the bottom of the screen represents the brain of someone who did not finish high school. What this uh, figure also shows is that Alzheimer's disease in the brain was more advanced in the brain with the highest levels of education. That's indicated by the orange that you see in that top brain pictured here. Even though Alzheimer's disease seems evident in the brain, the symptoms that generally indicate having Alzheimer's disease, such as confusion or memory loss, was much less than those who had lower education and less brain evidence. It appears, therefore, that education delays the onset of Alzheimer's disease or the number of years that we live showing the symptoms. So what it suggests is that education can be an extremely powerful resource that protects us uh, 
and reduces our risk of having Alzheimer's disease. So this is still another reason to encourage our young people to work hard in school and get an education. But also based on the other behaviors we, I just, I just spoke about that we've learned through research, um, it's also important that we teach our kids to eat well, to be social, to be kind to others and stay active. One of the things that we're learning very clearly is that prevention is a lifetime process. It just doesn't start as we get older. We need to start doing these things from very early ages and instill um, healthy lifestyle behaviors so that when we do reach old age, um, we can be the healthiest that we can be possible. Finally, engaging in activities that challenge your mind, including hobbies such as reading, playing an instrument, or doing art. Um, I want to show the uh, demonstrated effects of such activities by sharing findings from the Experience Core project. The Experience Core project essentially takes um, uh, takes older adults and trains them to go into schools and help uh, students. Uh, in elementary school with their reading and helps and um, helps, uh, I'm sorry, helps them uh, with their reading. And older adults also get involved in the library to give library support and go into the classroom to help with behaviors. They generally work for about 15 hours a week during an academic year. And what we found is that older adults who participated in Experience Core um, actually had uh, better memory four to eight months later than before they started. On the other hand, those who did not ex participate in Experience Core, they compared those who participated to those who didn't, actually had worse memory four to eight months later. So it really shows that um, these, this kind of, of activity that challenges your mind can have benefits um, that improve your memory. So something to keep in mind. Finally, though personal choices are important, the decisions that we make, our, our, our health uh, behaviors are very important. It's not the only way that we can reduce our risk. We also have to acknowledge that larger forces at the societal and, and environmental levels need attention. Um, this is why it's so important to assure to ensure that we advocate for and support policies that maximize a healthy society. So policies that reduce stress, make sure there's no discrimination in our society, um, reduce pollution. Stress, discrimination and pollution are all risk factors and they happen at the societal level. So we want to engage, we want to encourage all of us to engage in activities that support policies that ensure that we don't have these things so great in our society. They have all been linked to higher Alzheimer's disease risk. We need to ensure that our environment and communities minimize these things, making our world a better place is best for everyone, even those facing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. In sum, we are all living longer, which is an enormous gain for human development. Growing older is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, but working toward ensuring we are healthy in old age is doable. It takes commitment and effort from the individual through our families, community, and ultimately society. Planning for our future is one of the best actions we can take to maximize our quality of life. And so on that note, I would like to turn the um, screen over to Dr. Navid Saraji, a neurologist from the University of Michigan. And then following, uh, we'll turn the screen over to Melanie Baird, Vice President of the Greater Michigan Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Salam alaikum. Um, I was just going to uh, talk briefly about one of the uh, points that uh, Dr. Ajush had brought up, uh, which was what should one do if they uh, think that they may have uh, uh, signs of dementia or cognitive decline or any difficulty with their memories. So uh, the most important thing is don't panic. 
there is a lot of things that we can do uh, to address the concerns for cognitive decline. Um, and we should focus on doing those things rather than getting anxious and uh, worried and uh, take action towards it. The second thing that I wanted to mention is that the answer to that question is a little bit different depending on if we think we are having uh, the difficulty with memory and cognition or if it's a loved one who's having that difficulty. Um, and I want to just also mention as a side note that some people say, well, if I'm having difficulty with thinking and I know that I'm having difficulty with memory, it must not be a big deal because people with dementia don't know that they are having an issue. And I want to mention that that's just not true. There are people who are very aware of the difficulties they're having. And, um, you know, th that does not equal to they don't need to get any uh, help for that. And as Dr. Juice mentioned, um, the first step is talk to your healthcare provider. Um, see your primary care doctor, your nurse practitioner, whoever it is that you're getting your healthcare from. That would be the first step. And I would suggest that you do that specifically for that reason. Uh, you know, don't bring up to your doctor after you've seen them for a visit for you know, uh, the well, wellness visit, or if you're seeing them from a stomach pain or something like that, and just at the end of the visit say, by the way, I've been having some difficulty with memory. Doing a proper cognitive assessment at least takes 10 minutes. And in the, you know, busy primary care doctor who has about 15 minutes with a patient, it's best to call ahead and make an appointment for specifically for that reason, even maybe do a double booking where you have, they know that you're coming for that purpose and they are ready for you. Um, if it's on the other hand, somebody else, a loved one that you're concerned about and think they're having difficulty with memory, um, the best approach will be first to maybe if, if the relationship allows, talk to them and see where they stand. Um, in some way mention to them, well, have you noticed if you're having any difficulty with your thinking, with your memory, with finding your words? And if they say, yeah, you know, I noticed the same things, then you can uh, suggest to them and encourage them to see their doctor about it. If on the other hand, that's not the case and they say, well, no, I, I don't have any problems. There's nothing wrong with my memory. I'm perfectly fine. And you are really concerned about it. It's it's, a, it's, not, it's perfectly okay to contact their doctor, their healthcare provider and say, express your concern to them and ask them to address that in their next you know, uh, wellness visit or you know, next time that they see the patient. It's perfectly fine to do that. Um, and so in, in conclusion, you know, I just wanted to sort of reemphasize that Cognitive changes, uh, memory problems, and dementia um, are basically a part of life. A lot of us, as we get older, are going to be faced with that. And like anything else, if we face that challenge and learn more about it and address it um, with the help of our, uh, the help and support of our loved ones, it is it will be much easier to get through it and um, you know, face that challenge than if we were doing it on our own without any support and knowledge. So with that, I'll sign off from my end and turn over to Melanie. Thank you, Naveed. Um, and I, you know, couldn't agree more with what Naveed had was saying to all of you. You know, if you are experiencing signs um, of Alzheimer's, or you suspect someone that you know is showing signs of Alzheimer's, absolutely contact your healthcare professional to talk about that. Um, but I did also want to talk about some of the supports we have, and one of them happens to be our 24-7 uh, helpline number. So if that is something that you're experiencing, you can always connect with us as well. Um, you know, we have information that we share there. You can ask questions, again, day or night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you can get resources. So if you need a list of physicians or you need a list of neurologists, you can get those there in your community as well as other resources in the community and support. 
Um, so if you're an active caregiver caring for somebody with Alzheimer's disease and you're just trying to kind of navigate and get through some issues at the time, or if you're at the beginning and just need help trying to get mom or dad to the doctor's office to actually have that assessment, we're there to help. We also have a language line that offers translation services in over 170 languages. So if English is not your first language, that is okay. We're still here to help you. Um, and you know, as Christine was mentioning in her presentation, education and socialization being so important um, in terms of lowering your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, um, we also provide uh, resources and programs like that. So we have education programs on various topics, very similar to what you heard Dr. Ajrush talk about tonight as well. Um, you know, it can be anywhere from healthy living to 10 warning signs to effective communication strategies. So really available to anybody. Um, and we also have social engagement programs and support groups as well um, that can help, you know, just kind of give that recreational and socialization um, to people that are caring for people living with Alzheimer's and then those people themselves as well um, to just really try to optimize that you know, level of functioning for as long as possible. Um, so really, you know, I, I know that COVID-19 was brought up. I know that that kind of gets a little bit in the way of things, um, but you know, all of our programs and supports are virtual, they're dial-in. We try very hard to make sure that anybody can participate. And if you, um, you know, have any issues, again, connect with us at that 1-800 number, which is 1-800-272-3900, and we are happy and ready to help. Thank you, thank you, Melanie. Actually, can you say that number again, and maybe Noor can put it in the uh, comment box for folks? I sure can. Yeah, it's 1-800-272-3900. Wonderful, and I know that with that 24-7 hotline, you have a, um, the ability to communicate with people in Arabic as well if they prefer to speak in Arabic as opposed to English. And you have yep. how many languages on that line? Oh, it's like over 170 languages. So uh, many dialects of Arabic, I'm sure. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, we, we have a lot of questions and comments coming in from the audience. Um, I guess, it, it, um, Don, I can start. I can start with them. And then if as more come in, just let me know. But there's one, uh, and it, maybe Melanie, this is something um, that you can answer. And then uh, Navid, if you have anything to add, please do. But somebody wrote that she tries suggesting to her mom um, that maybe she needs to go see a doctor to get help, but her mom only has more rage when she mm. suggests it. Any suggestion? Was this was this question in Arabic, Jennifer? Or in English? It, um, yeah, English. It was in English. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, I have a lot of suggestions, but, um, you know, obviously, you know, getting our, our parents to the doctors to kind of assess this is, is a challenge, especially if they're exhibiting symptoms and, and are in denial of that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, expressing your concerns and, you know, validating any feelings of fear that that person is having is really important. Um, but sometimes that doesn't work either. So I know Naveed had suggested, um, you know, having the physicians call. That's always a good, uh, you know, a good tactic to take to, um, you know, talking about it as an annual wellness visit, as opposed to, you know, a, an exam to assess for, for cognition or for cognitive impairment or anything like that is also a good thing to kind of keep it more general. Um, seeing if there's somebody that's influential in that person's life. It could be a son, it could be a daughter, it could be a religious figure, it could be a friend, you know, um, you know, trying to have them talk to that person um, might, might also help as well. And if all of that doesn't work, you can always, again, call our helpline and we can get a social worker to talk with you and really kind of hone in because what works for one person doesn't always work for another person. So, um, you know, we can kind of walk you through that and brainstorm with you those, you know, person-centered um, really kind of ideas that work best for your, you and your family. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that, you know, the two things, I mean, most doctors are aware of that issue. They know that there are sometimes we have a loved one that is, you know, the family bring, brings them in. And, uh, you know, they really are not comfortable talking about 
uh, these things and they don't want that fam family dynamic of being blamed and so on. So we're happy to take that sort of on our shoulders and you know address it different ways. Um, a lot of testing, first of all, the concept of dementia is really something that a doctor doesn't, you know, you don't need a doctor to diagnose it because it's a matter of functionality. If a person's function is being uh, diminished because of their cognitive abilities, then the diagnosis of dementia can be made. You don't need really any tests for that. What we do test for are uh, secondary causes, vitamin deficiency, hormonal problems, um, any kind of uh, lesions on the brain. And those, are, those things, if we tell the patient, hey, we wanna check your vitamin level because it's part of your wellness. I'm sure most people will be uh, you know, amenable to that. And we don't even really need to bring up, well, we're doing it for this particular reason and um, you know, sort of get them more satisfied with that. So there, are, there is a lot of things to do and reaching out to the resources that are available would be the first step. Uh, Wasib, do you want to say any of that in Arabic? Because it looks like there was a second question very similar to that that said, um, how can you convince your, your eldest mother to see a neurologist? to get diagnosis on either dementia or Alzheimer. And I, I think uh, both Melanie and Naveed sort of touched on that. Yep, that sounds, that sounds good. So let me, خليني أحكي بشكل مبسط وملخص شو الدكتور نفيد والسيدة ميلاني قالوا. هل الشيء إنه تحاول تقنع حدا المقرب منك إنه يزور طبيب على الحديث عن مرض الدمنشا أو مرض الألزايمر هو شيء شيء صعب. لذلك المحاولة لازم تكون لحتى تقرب الفكرة للمريض ومش تجبره أو تجبره إنه يعملوا هالشيء وفي عدة عدة أشياء ممكن تنعمل ابن أو بنت كتير مقربين للمريض ممكن يتحدثوا معه قريب أو رفيق أو رفيقة مقربة لإلهم ممكن تحاول تقنعهم حاول إنه تخلي الحكي عن الزيارة هو مش زيارة لحتى تشخي على حتى تشخص مرض الألزايمر أو مرض الخرف بل إنه تكون زيارة لحتى نعمل فحوصات عامة مثلاً أو في إمكانية إنه نتحدث مع مع الطبيب طبيب الشخص طبيب العام للشخص لحتى يتصل بالمريض ويحاول يقنعه إنه يحضر الشغل اللي قاله دكتور نبي طبعاً هو إنه خلال خلال الزيارة خلال زيارة المريض لل الطبيب أو خلال التشخيص الحديث بيكون أقل عن مرض الألزايمر وعن النسيان وعن عن الخرف والحديث بيكون أكثر عن عن العوارض اللي بتتناسب مع مع هالأمراض النقص بالفيتامينات أشياء ممكن تكون أشياء طبية أو عبارات طبية الحكيم لازم يسأل يسأل عنها فلذلك خلال الزيارة المريض بيكون أكثر معتنى فيه لأنه الأطباء معودين على على هالأشياء هاي دي ما بدهم يصيروا حالة من الهلع أو من الزعر عند المريض لذلك بيكونوا كتير بيقدروا كتير بيحاولوا إنه يزيحوا الفكرة عن إنه في نسيان أو في مرض بالدماء. Okay, thank you. Um, and the question the question is is there a center for Alzheimer patients or do patients visit their regular doctor? Uh, would you like me to start that? Okay, so um, I guess it depends on what you mean by a center. There are certainly um, the primary care physician, uh, most internist as well as family physicians are able to uh, start the workup and uh, address pretty much all the medical needs of a person who is having either cognitive changes, cognitive difficulties, uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, what there are, however, um, clinics or centers that have all the resources in one place or more of the resources in the same place, which makes uh, getting the necessary assistance or treatment easier. Um, you have to keep in mind that taking care of somebody who has cognitive changes can sometimes require um, psychologists, 
psychiatrists, counselors, social workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and other, you know, people that will help. Um, for example, assessment of driving can be done by occupational therapists and so on. So uh, having or going to a, a memory care center or an Alzheimer's center is helpful because it allows access to all of those services in one place or a majority of those services in one place. Um, the other advantage of that is that occasionally we have patients who have unusual presentations um, of dementia. They only have difficulty with their language, for example, or they have a lot of visual hallucinations and so on. And recognizing what the disease is sometimes is not, um, you know, it's best done with some, by somebody who specializes in that field. And at least getting that opinion and having, again, um, that expertise uh, can be helpful. And then finally, some, most places uh, that have an Alzheimer's uh, disease center are also affiliated with the research side of Alzheimer's disease. And that allows for, again, more involvement with activities in the research community, in community, community. and also um, the folks who take care of um, these patients are more abreast of the newer medications and treatments that might be available. So yes, there is an Alzheimer's center. There are many Alzheimer's centers. Uh, in the state of Michigan, we have the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center, which is really a involved with Wayne State University, Michigan State, and University of Michigan. Uh, private sector places like Beaumont Healthcare and Henry Ford Hospital are uh, developing, and some of them have their you know, multidisciplinary clinic. You can certainly take advantage of those, but don't wait to get into you know, one of these centers. You can start with your primary care doctor you know, as the starting point um, you know, always. Okay. Um, and then I think, well, we're at 846 and this is supposed to end at 845, but there's two more questions. Let's just get those questions answered and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, one of the questions, and I think, um, uh, uh, Navid, this one I'll pose to you is, um, I heard there's a blood test we can take that will tell us if we have Alzheimer's. Is this true? How can I get one? Okay, um, so the blood test uh, to diagnose Alzheimer's disease is still a, a research uh, tool. Um, it will probably be coming to market soon, but we don't have it available yet. And I would just say that um, these biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease um, and other dementias have their utility and they are useful. But at this point, um, if someone had access to it and had a positive test for Alzheimer's disease, doesn't mean that they have dementia. It just means that they have the biomarkers. Therefore, it will determine their risk of um, developing dementia, but it will not diagnose dementia. Di dementia is a clinical diagnosis. It depends on the person's functional state. Um, so, and what, even they are, if they were available, they are a very useful to, tool, but I would not want to go out and get one for myself right now. Okay. So basically what you're saying is that the blood test can tell you if you have the, the, the biomarker for it, but it doesn't necessarily mean you will show the symptoms. Right. Exactly. In other words, it just shows that the abnormal protein is there. If the person has a positive test, if they have that biomarker, but they're functioning fine and their cognition is normal, that doesn't mean they have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, on the other hand, if they have the clinical symptoms and they have that biomarker be positive, then it helps diagnose whether it's Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And then the last question, and Melanie, I think that I'm going to pose this one to you, is um, somebody said, I noticed I'm forgetting more these days. Does that mean I have dementia? 
Um, yeah, not necessarily. Um, you know, Christine, I know you had mentioned too, you talked about obviously normal age related changes and that's something that, that happens when, you know, we forget where we put our keys or, um, you know, if you're like me, you walk into a room and forget what you were going in there for and then have to retrace your steps and eventually recall. Um, you know, people that exhibit, you know, signs of dementia and Alzheimer's will not be able to recall that. Um, but if you feel like you're forgetting, obviously, I think we've been kind of talking about this, the best thing to do is to go and talk to your doctor about it. Um, you know, another practical thing is, is document. So, you know, put down the dates, write down the things that you're forgetting, um, you know, have, have something there so that when you do go to the doctor, you can kind of let them know what's been going on and then they'll be better able to assess and, and try to figure out what's going on. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you both for your time and your insights. This has been so valuable and uh, we really appreciate you. you taking time to join us here at McFad. And I wanna thank everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live. Um, I want to rem remind everyone to please um, like our Facebook page and follow us for future events and updates. Um, we will, uh, I, I believe they've already been pasted in the comments, but again, uh, look for the link to become part of our participant research pool, as well as the link for the evaluation of today's event, because we want to hear from you in terms of what you'd like to hear in the future. So with that being said, um, everyone, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Thank you.